Okay, I, I know this is like the, uh, uh, just nearly the end of the day. You've got one more um, uh, uh, talk uh, this evening um, by Richard Forty, uh, so that's at quarter to eight, um, that you've had a productive and very long and intense day, uh, that you've already had um, a talk from me earlier about ecological cities, um, and that simply because of the programming of, of this schedule, um, uh, I'm talking about um, natural computing or ecological technologies. Um, and so what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, deliberately avoid areas that we've already spoken about in the, in the previous um, talk um, and just draw out some of the issues and concerns that may be associated with different ways of thinking. So that, uh, for example, Paul Virilio says that with the invention of the train, there comes the train crash. So I think that that's something that we shouldn't really be running away from. But I think in this particular talk, I'm just going to talk about the nature of the technological system that we identified um, in, this, in, the, in the conversation about ecological cities. Um, and think about what that means, not just in a very pragmatic way. And I will take a pragmatic um, uh, perspective. Um, that's partly the, 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 the tiny scientist in me. Um, but the other part is I think that um, uh, it, it grounds the ideas in, in a kind of material reality. But the other aspect of that is, of course, to raise cultural and uh, ethical issues um, that I don't think are going to be resolved uh, within the next hour. Um, but today's talk is an unconventional one. Um, I am going to use a variety of methods to paint a picture in, worlds in, a, in words of a uh, field of computing um, that uses a different hardware to um, the system of computing that we're currently familiar with, digital computing. Um, and the notion of a different kind of computational platform has far-reaching effects, both technologically, but also, I think, culturally and environmentally. And so I'm going to try in this particular talk to draw some of these threads together as an entanglement of speculative writing, real-world laboratory experiment, philosophical discourses, and descriptions of project work, which I've been involved in over the last four years. So some of them I've talked about earlier, but when I raise them again, it's in a slightly different context. So at the end of this presentation, I aim to draw your attention to the possibility of working with nature itself as a kind of technology. Again, thinking about its agency and what that means to negotiate with um, natural systems. But not just nature in itself, but also think about other technological developments in um, which the idea of technological properties of nature may be contextualized and even transformed themselves through um, what has been currently known as NBIC convergence, nano bio info cogno convergence, which is essentially a kind of uh, um, uh, technological singularity that's being um, proposed both um, in the States by the National Science Foundation and also in the EU. Um, but we'll, we'll have a little chat about that uh, uh, a, a bit later. Um, but I think it raises questions and explorations as to what, what these these possibilities might actually mean for engineering design, um, uh, and, and design and what it means in this particular context today of uh, thinking about um, the paradigms that shape human development. So I'm going to start off with a very short piece of speculative writing which um, uh, speaks to uh, particularly the Venice Beach project. The sudden effervescence of the oily solution was spectacular. On contact with the canal water, it instantly exploded into a galaxy of milky trails studded with little nebulae that forged concrete-like material using dissolved carbon dioxide and minerals. In this chemical universe, new stars were formed through molecular bonds and repetitive crystalline units that gave birth to pale geometric weeds along the waterways. The unique character of these synthetic growths was shaped by their combined interactions with marine currents, wildlife, shadows, reflected lights, pollutants, and effluvia. Forming new worlds together under the foundations of Venice, they thickened the girth of the narrow wood piles and spread the weight of the city over a much broader base to attenuate its sinking into the mud. So modern computing 
harnesses the properties of a particular kind of technology that uses mathematical abstractions and mechanical systems to build models of the world. Today, digital computers are such an integral part of our lives that we're harvesting vast amounts of data using these platforms. As if the World Economic Forum observes, it was the new oil, and these abstractions themselves have this incredible value. Yet digital computing has its limits. It is not embodied, but symbolic. Embodied in the sense uh, um, of uh, electron transfer and flow, so there is a kind of embodiment, um, but that embodiment is so rarefied, uh, I guess in this context we can think of it as being effectively unembodied. Um, so essentially its, its value really is, is through a symbolic media of, of zeros and ones, its fundamental basic language. And while it has enabled us to reflect on the shape of our thoughts to degrees that were formerly inaccessible, it does not enable us to directly materialize them. Instead, it relies on physical transformers, such as 3D printers, to interpret its outputs and retranspose them into material forms. In from, become the coming, sorry, in from Beyond the Coming Age of Network Matter, a short story by Bruce Sterling, he proposes that the material realm as we know it is just the graphic front end of cosmic code and only a fraction of what the network is all about. Sterling observes the following. Most of the cosmic code is dark energy and dark matter. The stuff we foolishly call reality is the cute friendly part with the kid colored don't be evil Google graphics. The true actual cosmic reality is the giant Google network pipes and the huge steel barns full of Google cloud. Indeed, mathematician Francois Chatelain observes that if digital computing becomes entrenched as the only computing platform available to us, then it is extinguishing the philosophy of mathematics, since we cannot evolve concepts such as number theory, which may bring us closer to realizing more naturalistic forms of computing. Perhaps we should really remember that it wasn't until the 16th century that the number zero was actually invented in the Western um, spheres of uh, you know, mathematical discourse. And of course, you know, the notion of infinity came even later. So um, by just simply working with the language of mathematics that is um, distilled in um, digital computing, we're effectively driving out you know, other forms of um, representation. And certainly Francois Chatelain is very interested in pursuing what she calls a mathematics of life. Yet the digital realm does not inevitably stand apart from the natural world. Like I say, there is this um, tangential relationship with a uh, material realm in the flow of electrons, which doesn't naturally uh, flow through pipes. That has to be engineered. But electrons do exist in, in nature. There are many organisms that use electron flow uh, you know, to sense their food or repel predators like electric eels or stun their prey. Um, and Rocco and Bainbridge were the originators of the NBIC report, which I mentioned right at the beginning of this talk, which is the convergence of the nano, bio, info, and cogno realms. Um, in other words, nanotechnology, biology, information technology, and cognition. Um, and the idea was that if these um, advanced forms of technology came together, they potentially create this, let's call it a singularity, a point at which a tipping um, point could be reached of transformation in the way that we could bring these information realms together. And potentially, we could bring about radical new benefits for humanity and the economy. Now, natural computing is something that we talked about a bit earlier, but I'm just going to reposition it again in relationship to the digital world. So it was in inspired by um, Alan Turing's interest in the computational powers of nature. It's a very different kind of computing to the digital platform, which is in series, whereas in uh, morphological computing or natural computing, um, it's a, a parallel um, uh, system of computation. Now, it, because of this parallelism, it offers a very powerful site for NBIC convergence by orchestrating the properties of matter. So obviously it's able to 
connect with um, digital technologies, but it also could connect with biotechnologies and potentially through um, uh, you know, digital technology, there may be ways in which cognition comes into that field as well. But it's actually not really evidence as to whether, uh, evident whether NBIC needs to be um, a, a attained in all four modes in, all, in order for it to be effective. I'm just really speculating on, on the potential of natural computing in, in this particular context. Um, so currently, natural computing embraces broad, overlapping, and multidisciplinary practices. Um, um, and they may be um, incorporating both you know, digital modeling of biological systems, so it does incorporate uh, digital um, uh, technologies, unconventional computing, which is a particular branch of natural computing um, that looks for um, non-Turing languages and non-Van uh, Neumann architectures. So it, it's deliberately going out of its way to search for alternative um, uh, computational platforms. Um, there's also morphological computing, which actually is a field of computing that arises from robotics in which the materiality or the, or the actual um, physical properties of the system contribute to the solution of the computational um, uh, uh, challenge in the first place. So it's actually a very physical engagement um, with generating solutions. So researchers include people like Martin Hanzek at the Southern University of Denmark, Sheriff Mansi at the University of Trento, Lee Cronin at the University of Glasgow, Klaus-Peter Zauner at the University of Southampton, Gabriel Villa at the University of Oxford, Andy Adamatsky at the University of West England, and people like um, uh, um, uh, 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 Hauser at the um, ETH in Zurich, um, you know, Helmut Hauser. So, I mean, these, these, these people are all contributing to um, these, these emerging fields. And they're, they're not, I mean, they've been going for the last 10, potentially 15 years. So they're actually rather new forms of, 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 of computation. Um, so the main goal in these fields is to develop programmable lifelike systems using a spectrum of different platforms to better understand and reflect the properties of living things, such as adaptation, learning, evolution, growth, development, and robustness. And owing to its embodiment and its parallel processing abilities, natural computing outputs embrace a different spectrum of pr uh, probabilities to those of machines. And over the course of human development, we've used living things in a technological context and manipulated them as such, from guiding the metabolic activities of horses to provide effective transport systems, to harnessing the genetics of different laboratory workhorses, such as um, E. coli and mycobacteria uh, genitalium, to underpin the emerging science of synthetic biology. But natural computing operates at a much lower level than biology. It does not require a centralized coding system like DNA, but works through distributed chemical methods that are founded on emergent and complex phenomena like self-organization or self-assembly. It's based in the common language of all natural systems which are shaped by physics and chemistry. And natural computing's operating system, as we heard earlier, is instructed by the actions of assemblages, a term that's been drawn from process philosophy, which articulates the behavior of matter and material systems in continual flux. In other words, they're complex um, systems that are not at equilibrium states, mostly far from equilibrium states. So from a technological perspective, the assemblage is composed of heterogeneous groupings of lively agents that amplify each other's effects through emergence. They therefore actively build networks between other lively bodies without the need for an external energy source, and they do this spontaneously. However, the assemblage does not exist as a mainstream technology and is not formalized in terms of its engineering operations or outputs. Yet these systems are very relevant to design in the 21st century, since they offer this potential to construct spatial programs and realize design tactics in ways that are different to machine paradigms. But whilst this is really very interesting, I think it's very interesting, how exactly do we 
um, for example, design with metabolism, as Timothy Morton suggests, is it really like trying to nail jelly to a wall? Working with assemblages is challenging as they require a new tool set, which doesn't actually exist yet. They're very different to object-centered systems as they're sensitive to and forge many connections with the environment. How do we garden or work with these connections? But it provides a different kind of production platform where a synthetic relationship, one of mutual exchange, can be developed between technology and our surroundings. So for example, natural computing may shape the interactions of assemblages so that networks of sustained interactions may be achieved like growth or repair. They may also be directed towards accomplishing human-centered goals. For example, assemblage technology may fix carbon dioxide that's been dissolved in the water into a material form to produce self-assembling mineral systems. So you've seen this kind of picture before. You can see that um, this is the Buchli system, uh, first um, observed by Otto Buchli in 1892. Um, and this has been a model system that I've used to, I guess, provide a lens on the performance of the assemblage operating system. And I like, I like this particular video because one, you can see that um, each of the bodies here are agentized. In other words, they possess their own kind of um, force which they exert and in, use to interact with the other bodies. You can also see how that they make their own products that, so that their computation is embedded in a kind of materiality when compared with um, digital forms of computing. You can also see that the relationships are parallel and non-hierarchical. Um, and also that, that this system is spontaneously produced. You don't have to make the objects. The system itself arises. But the, the interesting thing about that is perhaps only 15% of the um, materials used to create the original system, which, as you remember, um, comes from adding you know, simple alkali to an oil field, perhaps only 15% of it will actually be active. So there's quite a lot of wastage in the system. And then you actually have to search for those groups that, that actually can carry out this kind of work. Now, this is being observed in its, its raw state, as it were. You know, I've just added a, a droplet of alkali to an oil field, and so this spontaneous activity is happening. But potentially, we could optimize this system further. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying that in its raw state, it, it has a particular kind of um, performance. Um, and and I, I think of it as being a, a dynamic chemical um, program that's being spatialized. I think the spatial and temporal qualities are really important here. Because if you think about the way we think of chemistry, we think about two agents coming into contact with each other. Say, for example, hydrogen and oxygen. So two gases come into contact with each other, bam, water. Brilliant. Water is a kind of transformation, a, you know, a, a wonderful state, um, um, and a, you know, a, a completely novel output from, from, from these two collisions. But what if we spatialized that system? I mean, we start to think of things, not just the production of, of water, but you know, do we get vapors? Do we get rain? Do we get um, you know, st clouds, steams of clouds? I mean, how many different, do we get snow? I mean, how many different kinds of phenomena could we produce from that simple reaction simply by thinking about the conditions in which these reactions occur and you know and how we spatialize them I think a, probably a better example would be thinking about the spatialization of concrete if we explode all our um, reagents at once of uh, you know aluminium and magnesium and calcium and carbonates and you know mix them all up at once we can get geometric blocks um, which you know all look very nice but actually when you add all the ingredients to make concrete and you look at the um, chemical reactions that are taking place, you see these incredible silica tubes forming through concrete. It's a spectacular process whilst it's dynamic. Whilst concrete is setting, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm always kind of disappointed once it sets because all that dynamism in the system is, is, um, uh, is arrested. 
and it's been formalized into a particular geometric arrangement. So what if we could keep those beautiful silica tubes alive or dynamic for um, a much longer time? You know, potentially, instead of getting a very solid block of matter, we could get much more spongy forms of uh, concrete that may have different kinds of resilience because of their um, internal configuration. So they've been extended you know, through these different qualities. Um, so, I mean, I like the idea of natural computing as um, uh, this, 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 this tightly entangled, you know, very um, uh, kind of intimately coupled, um, you know, fabric and software, um, you know, that, that can produce microstructures. It has this, you know, you know printing capacity. Um, and so the overall performance of this system, which, you're, you're, you know, you're seeing change uh, um, in front of your eyes. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a um, you know, structures being produced in this process. And if I actually let it run long enough, you'd probably see some agitated states as it uh, uh, reaches the werewolf transition phase before it kind of goes to sleep. Um, but, 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 you know, the, the, the dynamism and, and I guess the performativity of this system becomes incredibly intriguing because it is working in a, in a completely different way to machines. And yet, and yet, um, there is still a programmability about this system which is equally intriguing. So whilst I discussed that um, we can um, scale up this system so that it can reach several centimeters in diameter, what I didn't say last time was actually um, it's not just by putting things in the um, um, external and internal medium that will um, shape outcomes, but actually I can create patterns within this system by, um, by provoking spatial constraints. So this is an installation that was done in Vienna at the Natural um, History Museum as part of the Synthetic Group show. Um, and uh, what I did was I put this into a tank that was um, uh, two centimeters wide. So it was really like um, uh, creating an oil suspension um, in a double glazed window right in the middle. Um, and so when the um, droplets, um, which were created in a, a monolayer, first of all, all the droplets were, were laid out at, a, at an oil interface, so it had a heavy oil to lift it up off the bottom, and a lighter oil through which the droplets would sink um, to, to, to reach this uh, you know, state where it was easy to light and observe in a public space, um, actually started to see quite remarkable self-organization in the system, which produced Turing bands. Now, Turing bands were first described by Alan Turing in his 1952 paper on morphogenesis. Um, and he proposed that this system um, uh, created you know, these, this spatial banding um, and that this was responsible for some of the patterns in biological systems, such as gastrulation, which is um, an invagination of the embryo in early stages of development. He also thought it was responsible for animal skin patterns, specifically dappling. And he felt that you know, these biological processes were really, a, a bit like Boochley, uh, rooted in physical and chemistry, uh, chemical processes, not some kind of vitalistic force, not some kind of ephemeral agency that, uh, uh, I guess, was infused in life in order to make it special. Um, now, today, these kinds of effects, these banding effects, are attributed to the actions of information molecules like RNA, ribose nucleic acid. Um, however, um, since the lifelike properties of the Boochley system are chemical and not biological, Turing's theory is actually responsible for the sinusoidal patterns produced in this system. So this is actually a very good demonstrator of Turing's uh, morphogenesis theory. So natural computing is therefore susceptible to many influences. And because it possesses innate agency, the platform itself has the capacity to co-design events that are relevant to human design and engineering tasks that may, may be directed and orchestrated through humans. Um, and so these chemical assemblages, this is a, 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 a kind of a, an assemblage of water, um, so bubbles on, uh, of, of scum on, uh, uh, on, a, on a Venice uh, tiny wave um, in the sunlight. Um, uh, and, and I think this is kind of a beautiful um, model for me of, of what the, um, the protocell droplets that I was proposing, which I cannot add into the Venetian lagoon, might look like, that they would float on the surface of the water and form these populations that would then um, respond to um, uh, the presence of sunlight. 
So um, chemical assemblages have a range of outputs, as we saw a bit earlier, which we can start to express through drawing maps. Um, and whilst machine outcomes are predictable, the assemblage operates within a range of limits, um, which are defined by the internal and external conditions. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about this from a design perspective is that it starts to evade the traditional binary divi uh, divisions between various systems and modalities, such as nature, machine, humanism, environmentalism, and matter information. In dissolving these divisions, natural computing ultimately increases the connectivity of matter within the environment. In other words, the assemblage becomes the operating system that enables us to build ecologies. So natural computing may therefore be imagined through the language of ecology and its outcomes orchestrated using soft control techniques. Yet for natural computing to be socially relevant, it needs to produce human-centered impacts. And so I outlined the future Venice project earlier, um, a thought experiment and a series of illustrations and prototypes that discussed the possibility of co-constructing an artificial limestone reef underneath the city to um, attenuate its sinking into the um, soft mud on which it stands, um, in collaboration with the accretion systems of the marine wildlife I'm using this, this programmable, light aversive droplet system that um, uh, uh, precipitates out minerals that exist in the lagoon. But whilst Future Venice offers one particular possibility, natural computing processes could be applied to the whole bioregion of Venice. Developing the right kinds of metabolisms and spatial programs could give rise to tactics that generate new relationships between natural and artificial agents and become the bedrock for forging life-promoting synthetic ecologies. Natural computing then becomes a practice of shaping overlapping spatial programs and developing design tactics that enable a constant flux between fabric, space, structure, and location. And the outputs of the systems do not imitate nature, but operate according to low-level programming principles or sub-natures. These are then affected through the spontaneous horizontal couplings that occur between different assemblages using a common chemical language that is based in physics and chemistry that is shared by the natural world. Yet natural computing does not propose to make a comprehensive solution to Venice's precarious future or in any, uh, in, in, indeed any kind of ecological future. Um, it does not intend to solve environmental woes because it recognizes that the environment is always constantly in flux. And to actually solve that in some way is to make it static. Um, and in other words, would actually kill the dyna dynamism in the system. So it does not intend at all to um, resolve um, uh, change and flux. If anything, it would prefer to potentiate it. Um, so. Um, Natural computing really is powerful in the sense that it offers a convergent platform um, that enriches the available opportunities by which human and non-human communities can take action and respond to environmental events and challenges by co-designing their shared futures through the orchestrated construction of synthetic ecologies and weaving post-natural fabrics in our living spaces. Yet it is important to ask just how successful natural computing with matter at far from equilibrium states may be. Since despite 150 years of considered scientific experimentation, to date, we have not successfully created, from life, uh, created life from scratch in the laboratory, although J. Craig Venter's Cynthia was a technologically stunning feat. The synthetic life form that was reported by the international media was a radical modification of existing living parts, not the genesis of life de novo. And only last week, scientists at the New York University School of Medicine produced the most extensively altered chromosome ever built. But the milestone that really counted in this particular experiment was integrating it into a living yeast cell. So we are making really significant technological milestones in terms of biotechnology. And yet the foundational research of what does it actually mean to convert a material system from being at equilibrium to non-equilibrium is still very much a mystery. And I think that this is actually at the heart of, I guess, our lack of success at designing origins of life experiments to interrogate what the processes are that takes us away from something that is inert 
and transforms it towards a state that it is more lively. Now, we can do it very simply, say, by taking a Bunsen burner or some huge heat source and, um, you know, vaporizing it or, uh, you know, melting it into something molten, so changing state that way. Um, but, but essentially, the, the, the tactic is how do we do it in a way that changes the state in a sense that it becomes persi a persistent phenomenon and consistent with some of the properties that we're associating you know, throughout this uh, series of talks with lifelike systems. In other words, movement, sensitivity, um, uh, interaction with other bodies. Um, so, you know, whilst we can change states quite simply, actually how we can change them in ways in which the energy within them persists as if they were dissipative structures, which are these um, uh, kind of massive flows of, of chemical energy and matter that seem to remain stable because they can take energy in and also um, release it in order to um, create forms like tornadoes or vortices. Um, so when we're designing origins of life like, um, experiments, we go about the experiment in a very particular way. We've analyzed many fo life forms, decided what structures and processes can uh, constitute terrestrial life, and then we try to reverse engineer these systems from their parts. I was uh, remarking earlier to one of the groups, I think it was the Venice Beach group, that actually you know, the, the mainstay, up, and, you know, up until very recently, the mainstay of our understanding of life has actually been based on information that has been derived when we kill it. Because the way that we observe living processes is through particular techniques and technologies that require it to be inert in order for us to observe it. So when you cut something up or observe it underneath the microscope, you can't have it wriggling around because you'll never get it in your field of uh, focus, which is you know, one of the problems that I've had with trying to film the droplets under uh, my, uh, microscopy uh, you know, to try and capture their dynamic systems. I could try and freeze fracture it and have a look at the droplets, but it's not really going to tell me very much about why that droplet is actually moving or how that droplet is actually moving. And yet, you know, to date, that really has been the mainstay of our understanding of life's processes, which we've actually harvested from um, death programs. I mean, that's a kind of, I guess it's a, a colloquialism, but it's actually, you know, the, the, re the reductionist method of observation um, has required us to do that. And this is why the age of synthetic biology, whereby we can start to manipulate um, already dynamic and lifelike systems, becomes very interesting because we can start to provoke events within those systems that may increase the vigor, um, increase the complexity of these systems, and generate novel outputs or disruptions that tell us something new about the system. So I think something like life, and, and looking at this idea of how we take something that that's static and inert and, and transform it into something that is lively, I think really is, is the kind of foundational research that we should be doing if we're thinking about these kinds of um, technologies. And I think it will inform um, much, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, much more clearly the, the, the origins of life sciences. Um, so I also think that there's another aspect missing from um, uh, the current approach, which is um, that we don't tend to observe the impact of environment on these lively configurations. So obviously, Charles Darwin first noted the entangled relationship between life and its proximate environments. So whilst we've paid a lot of attention in designing the system, and, and figuring out which bits um, a, a cell, for example, is made up of, we spent much less time considering the nature of the environment in which the genesis event is likely to occur. I mean, what are the conditions in which lifelike events um, may be um, most likely um, to take hold? So in fact, classical scientific experiments are designed to function when ex environments are stable and inert. In other words, when we try to attempt to create life in the laboratory, we assume that the environment is already a constant. I mean, that is the nature of the scientific experiment. We design controls to stabilize environments. Um, and that premise is actually built into the experimental system. I think another contributing factor is that we have a very stringent definition of life, which Andrew Ellington, who's a fantastically outspoken uh, synthetic biologist, observes doesn't actually help us build it. 
While centers of expertise, such as the Santa Fe Institute, have adopted Tibor Ganti's Chemiton model, which proposes life is made up of a compartment, information, and um, information system and a metabolism, again, it's been um, objectified as being three components that need to be brought together as a kind of machine. Um, it doesn't imagine a living system as an integrated thing. And this matters because when life is imagined as an irreducibly integrated system, it cannot be built from parts, but needs to be self-assembled from a fundamental recipe. And yet we have a much longer design history of working with objects than with processes and systems, um, unless we're working in agriculture and really within um, the modern system, that is something that we become increasingly distant from. However, we've reached a point, actually, in, in, in biotechnology and synthetic biology where this worldview is changing. And following the advent of the internet, I think that this you know, cultural tipping point in human development, where the possibility of designing with impermanence and process is starting to be tackled using the science of complexity and the language of process philosophy. And I think that this is going to produce a different set of tactics um, to classical enlightenment science or classical engineering and even you know, product-based industrial design. Um, and, and I think that um, the kinds of practices we'll see will deal with networks, relationships, flows, rather than objects, Euclidean geometries and hierarchies. So how do we start to think about this kind of transition? You know, particularly, let's use the idea of the design of, of living things, not necessarily life itself, but these kinds of natural computing systems. How might we start to think about what natural computing is, what are the conditions for it, and therefore how might we engage and use it when we're thinking about design strategies? So we cannot think of them as being static, but they're always undergoing continuous change or movement. So in some ways, you know, Bruno Latour's notion of post-epistemological um, starts to kick into play because if we can't actually um, uh, kind of grab it and define it at any particular moment, how do we know what it is that we're working with? Um, so I think thinking about design with inherently un unstable conditions um, is really going to challenge us um, to try to develop um, new methods and, and forms of approaches that um, you know, start to take us beyond um, the practices that we know. And I, I think that increasingly um, multidisciplinary partnerships, so particularly with design and science, and will be uh, very fertile areas of uh, experimentation. Um, but, I, but I also think that um, the uh, kind of, you know, working with um, uh, philosophy and language will be equally as important to make sure that our frameworks are actually able to support the intentions and the ideas that we're trying to provoke. And I'm not saying that every provocation results in a product or something really useful. These provocations actually tell us more about the system, something that we didn't know before. And yet, with all the provocation and instability, there is an anxiety, particularly when dealing with lifelike and fully alive systems. A concern that obviously um, was uh, you know, first expressed vociferously, vociferously um, with the advent of nanotechnology. Such grey goo scenarios imagined the end of the world where out of control programmable machines, tiny little machines, would consume all matter on Earth whilst building more of themselves. Indeed, Bill Joy notes that this is the first moment in the history of our planet where any species, by its own voluntary actions, has become a danger to itself, as well as to vast numbers of others. Plants with no leaves, no more efficient than today's solar cells, could outcompete real plants, crowding the biosphere with an indelible foliage. Tough, omnivorous bacteria, could outcompete real bacteria. They could spread like blowing pollen, replicate swiftly, and reduce the biosphere to dust in a matter of days. Dangerous replicators could be easily be too tough, small, and rapidly spreading to stop, at least if we make no preparation. We have trouble enough controlling viruses and fruit flies. Thus spaketh Bill Joy. Um, Yet such scenarios make quite a few assumptions about the capabilities 
of um, biological systems. In fact, those kinds of propositions assume a mechanical efficiency in the nature of life and its capacity to survive. In our own experience, very few life forms, perhaps excluding ourselves, can literally consume the earth without checks and balances, mostly through resource availability and positive and negative feedback systems. Most ecological patterns go in sinusoidal cycles of, of growth and decay. So for example, once bacterial biofilms dominated the earth for millions of years, leaving behind their hallmark in the fossil records as stromatolites, at other times, Earth was swarmed with woodlouse-like trilobites, which dominated the Earth, or squid-like ammonites. The point being that life is sensitive to its context and its time. And although parasites and infestations do exist at the detriment of other species, there has not yet been to date a particularly malignant species that has persisted indefinitely. Living things do tend to retune themselves to function within the limits of the system. And although I would never say that a grey goose scenario is an impossibility, nor would I say that we should not apply some aspects of the precautionary principle within our design and engineering of uh, living systems, I would say that the expectations of life and what it can do are, you know, should not really be exaggerated. In, as, as in, I think, the grey goose scenario, and that when working with these systems, when provoking them, we should pay attention to the materiality of the systems, become engaged with them, and that means that we can actually try to design control systems into them at very early stages and work out how we might start to have proper conversations using physics and chemistry to influence the agency within these systems using natural computing techniques. The other challenge when thinking about lifelike systems is that they do have a tendency, more likely than, than it is for them to become rampantly proliferating, to decay towards equilibrium and become inert. That was um, Erwin Schrodinger's observation in 1944 when he was observing the definition of life, which was that it was a system that evaded the day to, uh, decay towards equilibrium. Um, he, said, he never said that it could do so indefinitely. Um, and yet, if we have a system that innately um, uh, you know, embarks on this journey to quiescence and inertia, is such an event a failure? So cycles of life and death are intrinsic to the persistence of dynamic material organization, as in this uh, famous drawing, famous and notorious drawing by um, Ernst Haeckel, who was uh, manipulating, apparently, data um, to uh, suit his own theories um, about embryonic development. In other words, ontology um, recapitulates phylogeny. Um, so he believed that, um, uh, that the different um, phyla of the animal kingdom were all represented through um, the, the uh, embryological development system. So you started off as a fish, then a reptile, and then you became a, a lower mammal, then a higher mammal. And so his, his drawings uh, reflected that belief. But I, but I put this picture up essentially because it shows you the, the amount of convolution and movement that happens within embryogenesis. And part of what is responsible for that is actually massive programmed cell death and reprogramming within the system. So even within life, there are um, sections and, and, and times and windows of opportunity whereby cells may become reappropriated or they may actually be programmed to decay. And so even in the earliest forms of organization in the embryo, there are these you know, massive complex spatial arrangements. I mean, this is a particular form um, of a rearrangement called gastrulation, where you get the primitive streak, which is the early nervous system, folding into the, the basic embryonic plate. Um, and, and, and it's associated with incredible complex spatial events, um, some of which necessarily involve cell death. And such processes have been encapsulated in design programs such as the Embryological House by Greg Lynn. Now, when living processes become autonomous or immortal and evade this programmed cell death or can uh, uh, um, exist uh, autonomously, particularly when they're in multicellular systems, we recognize them as cancer or tissue cultures when we design them that way, which can persist and survive 
beyond the community of tissues that we call the body. Now, this not only raises ethical questions about the nature of these events and how and whether it should be possible to design with them, but also asks us about cultural impacts in such practices, such as in J. Rim Lee's work with a notion of the mushroom burial suit that purifies her decomposing body. She, she proposes that when she dies, she wants to be in, um, uh, buried in this um, mushroom burial suit, uh, which is a mycelial network that um, uh, can um, take away all the toxin in her body so that she can provide pure compost as an act of regeneration. So when we ignore the importance of these cultural tropes, it also raises further questions about our own contemporary views on mortality, um, particularly in such processes um, that are preserving the bogmen at the National Museum of Ireland whereby decomposition of the body was regarded as key to the passage of the soul into the afterlife. I went to see these um, uh, um, bodies, and, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of tragic and horrific. I mean, I, I know that there are some in Denmark, um, but, but the, the ones that are in the Museum of Ireland um, all have been brutally murdered. I mean, they have been tortured before they have obviously been thrown into the bog. And there's a reason for throwing them into the bog, and that is to stop them from going to Valhalla. And so it then raises the question, if the Museum of, of, of Ireland is pro protracting that purgatory and un not letting these, these, these poor souls uh, achieve the decomposed state that allows them to go on to their afterlife, is that moral? I mean, it's very nice to be able to look at these, uh, these, these bodies and learn about our cultural history. Um, but are we not simply perpetuating abuse in, in, in this particular context? And I think this notion of preservation and evading decay is a particularly modern obsession. This is Natasha Vita Moore's notion of um, an augmented body, um, whereby preparation to resist the errors produced by biological systems spontaneously are combated using advanced mechanical technologies and biotechnologies that propose to upgrade biology through strategic enhancements, as Aubrey de Grey would say, you know, kind of iterative upgrades, you know, as um, you know, the innovation within biotechnology and genetic understanding um, increases. These may have um, potentiating effects on our um, longevity. And so these strategies are proposed to confer survival advantages in a particular worldview known as transhumanism. Transhumanism panders to very old ideas, which the modern age looks to achieve using new technological strategies to deal with the revival of the body. So here the promise of resurrection is at a time when nanotechnology can provide the restorative interventions promised for people that have cryogenically preserved their whole bodies or heads in the hope of resurrection at some arbitrary time in the future. So Alcor is actually dedicated to the process of cryosuspension, or particularly the specialty, the neurosuspension. And it is alleged that people like Walt Disney um, actually have their, their bodies suspended in these um, uh, cryogenic vats. Um, again, as a kind of expensive form of burial, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but again, it, it, it's, it's talking about a, a particular set of belief systems um, that are resisting forms of decay. I guess no different to the way that the Egyptians um, wanted their bodies mummified and their organs extracted. Um, so, so these are very important belief systems that, 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 that relate our cultures to notions of regeneration and survival. Yet what are the ethics of preventing death in projects such as de-extinction, whereby extinct species, already extinct species, such as the woolly mammoth, are being proposed to be cloned back into existence using modern ancestors and um, synthetic biology. Um, in many ways, um, by achieving these acts, we're also preventing regeneration and change. Even when we think about preserving ecologies through transformation, uh, through, through cons conservation, um, such as in the Galapagos Islands, where people aren't al allowed onto the island in case the ecosystem is disturbed, 
They may be regarded as being anti-evolutionary and not enabling the processes of change and decay and trying to arrest cycles of life from being open and being able to function through um, exchanges with, with all the events that are happening in the material flows of the, of, of the contemporary world. Um, and, and it's preventing their reassimilation through soils and microbial recycling systems on which new growth and fertility depend. So by preventing this, this notion of decay, decomposing, extinction, mass extinction, um, a death in, in, in general, you know, we're actually trying to decouple life from much broader systems of exchange. And I'm not saying that that's a right or wrong thing. Um, you know, nobody particularly wants to volunteer to die. Um, but I think there's a cultural aspect here of the kinds of choices that we make and the kinds of technologies that we use and our relationship to the ecological systems that are affected by those choices. So the issue here is not to problematize life, nor to try to prevent its opposite state, but to accept that when using a technology that can fundamentally transform itself, that this is one of its properties. In this particular experiment, with, um, uh, this is, was done at, um, in uh, Bucharest, um, and um, a, a, a green fluorescent protein enhanced E. coli bacteria were introduced into um, a, uh, what, what did I call it, the terminator algae. This is an algae called Bryopsis, um, which has this incredible power of regeneration. It's amazing. You can take the seaweed, it's a little hairy seaweed that you find on, this, on the shores of the Black Sea, and you can take a razor blade and you can chop it up like sushi. There you go. There it is, and then you put it into an alkaline solution of water, and over the course of the month, this thing will totally rebuild its body. Now, it can do that because it's a giant cell. In other words, it's got lots of different nuclei, and it's not um, divided by a cell wall. So the whole of this body, which is about 15 centimeters, it's about as big as my hand, 15 centimeters big. Um, and so all of that will reconnect itself. And when it does, it has what I call a, a dustbin metabolism. It will take up any kind of stuff that you put into the environment in order to reconstitute itself. It will eat junk food, okay? So including... GFP labeled bacteria. So this was really a way of looking at this, this voracious appetite of this, of this giant cell um, to reconstitute it um, once it was mechanically damaged. Um, and so, you know, this, so these, these kind of regenerative powers, I'm, I'm not saying that they're, you know, that they are, um, uh, you know, not welcome. I'm just talking about what does it mean when we make choices about these kinds of systems? What is it that we are actually doing? And I think particularly these are pertinent when we're thinking about ecological beings that, that do seek a more equitable relationship and conversation with the natural world. Now, so while such possibilities of nano, bio, info, cogno, convergence might just be another form of wishful thinking or singularity scenario, where our tools for predicting outcomes in a deterministic sense break down with the passage of time and complexity, it is also possible to take a very pragmatic view of these possibilities for change and transformation by nurturing, exploring, experimenting with new fusions in ethically minded, context sensitive and engaged ways. And accept that our explorations will always involve risk. I do not think that in the 21st century that it is actually appropriate to think that somehow or other we're going to do things that are risk free. Um, I also don't think it is necessarily to factor out risk as being a part of an experiment. I think that when you're being propositional and synthetic about new relationships between things, I think that necessarily engages risk. And it may be that we want to provoke risk in these um, situations so that we actually create the kinds of disruptions that tell us something new about the system. But I'm going to say that when we do this, we need to be extremely strategic about it, mindful about it, and, and, you know, and, and really um, you know, open up and, and be very transparent about what it is that we're trying to achieve and what the results are actually showing us. And this is a, a kind of a rather odd experiment called cyberplasm. 
Um, and it's one of these NBIC um, um, projects um, that's uh, kind of got a bit of electronics. It's got a bit of synthetic biology in there. Um, and I'm not really quite sure what it does. It just seems to be, be, be like one of those things that we think it represents NBIC, but actually I'm not sure it really has a purpose. Um, so I, I think that you know, our experimentations with this right now are very speculative, even within science, because I would, you know, I, I would like to know what exactly that is supposed to achieve that we haven't got something else that could achieve it. To me, this seems to be just like a, um, a kind of a set of Arduinos that, that, that we bolted together and go, look, we got one of them. Now, how are we going to use it? And I would also, I would actually kind of look deeper, I think. I think that, you know, trying to design the object, which is, I think, is what cyberplasm does. I th personally, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. I think that we need to look deeper into the design and engineering strategies that provoke the context in which new fusions can take place. In other words, we're starting to design the pre-ecologies, the, the elemental infrastructures in which transitions and transformations and kind of new configurations can take place. And I really think that soils are a kind of transitional technology which could potentially bring about NBIC convergences um, by working with different media, um, working with notions of transformation through catalysis and spatial arrangements, and really start to explore what it means to insert time and space into material systems. Now, I think ultimately these approaches do not deny the importance of mechanical technologies and digital computing. I don't think these things are going to go away. Rather, I think that their impacts are going to be transformed in this convergence, including, I think, the impact of natural systems, so that, um, so that we really are, are looking for the kinds of reconfigurations that do not damage our ecosystems, but strengthen them. And I think that that's really what we need to be mindful um, for. I don't think there's a magic program. I don't think there's a magic button. I don't think there's a magic combination. I think this requires a re-engagement and re-visualization uh, re and, and re-vigilance um, uh, uh, as to the kinds of things that we're actually trying to attempt to do. And I think that requires us to have very clear visions as to what it is that we hope to achieve. Not all the vibrant chemistries were destined to become part of the reef. Some were eaten by fish fry. A handful speckled the footpaths like discarded chewing gum, and others floated like little polystyrene beads on the crest of churning currents. Yet the misfortunes of the few were outweighed by the successes of the many. As long as the test sites were fed with new droplets and minerals, the crystalline structures continued to grow around the wood piles and vigorously protruded from the canals as strange mosaic gardens that were clearly visible at low tides from the shore. A few colonies even spread across the lagoon and became feral, somehow surviving without human intervention, and worked in concert with the marine wildlife to redefine the very edges of Venice. Thank you. <laughs>